We'd like to welcome you to a case studies approach lunch and learn series. What we're trying to do is support permitted businesses and help them understand their permit better and provide resources for them. Uh, this is being held by Washington Stormwater Center and ECOS um, and the workshop is funded by the Boeing company. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Um, I'm Lisa Rosman. I'm the, oh, are we going to go through this I, first? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you guys are in a Zoom webinar. Um, some things to know as you go through this. It is being recorded so that we can share it with others. All attendees are muted and have their video off. We'll have a five, uh, actually, we'll have a 10 minute Q&A and a five minute break after each 30 minutes. What we're gonna do is a 20 minute presentation, a 10 minute Q&A, and then a five minute break so we can change over to the next presentation. Ask your questions using the toolbar at the bottom of your screen by clicking on the Q&A, or you can put it in the chat. Um, feel free to write questions using the Q&A feature throughout the presentation, and we will either type an answer or answer the questions live during the designated Q&A points. You can see at the bottom of your screen a chat button and a Q&A button. So my name is Ann Boyce and I'm with ECOS. Um, I am the Stormwater Outreach Program Manager. I started with ECOS in 2001 and I've been hosting and managing the Industrial Stormwater Management Workshops since 2011. Um, sorry, I said I was with 2001. I'm in 2011. <laughs> I helped develop and then I host and manage municipal stormwater training programs since 2016. I help businesses keep pollutants out of stormwater runoff and local waterways. And I'm experienced in educating businesses about recycling, composting, hazardous waste handling, and fat soils and grease management. Um, as I said, I'm with ECOS. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. We've been around for over 26 years. Uh, our key areas are stormwater rainwise, which is LID and green stormwater infrastructure, our low impact development and green stormwater infrastructure, recycling and solid waste. We provide outreach and education, on-site technical assistance, employee training and workshops and forums. As you can see, we've got a diverse staff. We've got about 12 languages on site or on staff, so we can provide employee training in language if needed. And I'm Lisa Rosman. I'm the assistant, manager, assistant director of the Washington Stormwater Center. And for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a collaboration between um, the University of Washington um, and Urban Center for Urban Waters and Washington State University. Um, I manage the day-to-day -day things and things like budgets, but I also have a grant from Boeing to help businesses with their industrial stormwater permit. We also have a, um, a construction stormwater permit assistance center as well. Um, and I've been, was this, oh, sorry. That's okay. That's all right. No, it's, that's fine. We do research. We do um, municipal uh, permit help and, um, and the industrial as well. We also do an emerging technologies program called TAPE. Um, some of you might be familiar with that. Um, it's to make sure that the, um, the treatment devices that are being used by municipalities do what they say they're going to do. So that's, that's handled by our um, UW Tacoma folks at Center for Urban Waters. I think that's it. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, you're welcome. Our speakers today include Kelly Garber, who is with SSA Marine. He spent the last 30 years in the cargo handling industry with a specific emphasis on terminal operations. He's held various leadership roles in container and brake bulk operations with extensive experience in safety and security. Um, he's an environmental director at the SSA Marine with accountability for all the environmental compliance and affairs across the network. Uh, he oversees the stormwater treatments, it, treatment system implementation project at Terminal 18, which is in Seattle, and works closely with the design team during planning and construction. He oversees the industrial stormwater permit compliance at Terminals 5, 18, and 30 at the Port of Seattle and West Sitcom Terminal at Port of Tacoma. So he's got a lot of work to do. Um, he's got a wide range of practical experience with various BMP strategies, especially in operations and maintenance post-insulation. So he'd be a good resource if you need him. 
Eric Jacobs is with ACE Galvanize. He's been there for 36 years and he's currently the Environmental Health and Safety Manager, Stormwater Program Coordinator, Hascom Trainer, Forklift Instructor, Boiler Operator, IT Manager, Energy Analyst, Webmaster and Head Geek, a multi-habit person, uh, biology and graduate at the University of uh, Oregon and he studied at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. He plays disc golf, enjoys building and riding electric bikes, and is a member of the Kent Bicycle Advisory Board. And Mike Auer, who works with Rainier Petroleum, is currently the terminal manager for the four Pacific Northwest facilities, two of which have industrial stormwater permits. He joined Rainier in spring of 2016 to fill the environmental compliance manager position responsible for addressing stormwater issues and implementation of two consent decrees, and boy, are they doozies. Previous positions include a U.S. Coast Guard Certified Tanker Man, Tank Ship Agent, and a Marine Transportation Safety Specialist for Ecology Spill Prevention Program. So he's on, he's been on both sides. So this is good. Great background. He believes that ever improving upon safe, clean, and compliant operations is good for people, the environment, and businesses as well. So I think these three are going to provide some excellent presentations. I encourage you to look at them as resources both today as well as in future pro programs. And we just want to give you a workshop overview um, just to let you know these workshops are here to fulfill an educational need for industry. We like to partner with technical teams and stormwater professionals, um, and they're for the people on the ground making the, the hard decisions. A lot of our workshop uh, attendees are have less than two years experience, more often one year or less, or just even starting. And often they have no engineering or science background. So we're here to help you guys um, understand at a layperson level how to implement the permit. The goals for our workshops are empowering attendees with knowledge and tools to successfully manage your facility's stormwater programs and help your company comply with the industrial stormwater permit. Um, today, we have permitted businesses helping permitted businesses and uh, provide a series of resources and wrap up for you. And today's objectives are to, um, to learn how to respond if you receive a notice of intent. Uh, listen to the stories of businesses that have struggled and then achieved and maintained compliance with their stormwater permit. Provide an open forum to ask other businesses how they've dealt with difficult stormwater issues and provide resources mm -hmm. and contacts to industrial stormwater permittees for future assistance. Oop. I think the next, yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna turn this over to Kelly. Who is our, yeah, Kelly, so he can talk about SSA Marine. Thank you. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, let me just uh, get the presentation brought up for you here and we'll get started. And if somebody could just confirm that that really is uh, visible. Yes, yes. All right. All right. Here we go. All right, so we're SSA Marine and we are a uh, terminal operator worldwide. We have uh, over 250 locations in five continents. We basically handle every kind of cargo that there is, uh, break bulk cargo, containerized cargo bulk. We do passenger operations for the shore side portion of that and, and automobiles as well. Um, today, we're gonna talk about specifically Terminal 18, um, it's a container terminal located on Harbor Island. Um, it's a very large terminal uh, in the Pacific Northwest, the Northwest Seaport Alliance. Um, and we are busting at the seams as most container terminals are right now up and down the coast. Um, I think we're on our way to eclipsing that 600,000 containers handled per year. Uh, the facility has uh, a little over 4,000 feet of dock, so three working berths and an on-dock rail facility. So we handle cargo coming on and off ships via both truck traffic and uh, on dock rail we load ourselves. Stormwater treatment, okay. Before we get into stormwater treatment, we need to understand what we're looking at as far as the terminal structure and the infrastructure for these facilities is pretty extreme. Um, the terminals in the Northwest Seaport Alliance have all been around for many decades. They've seen significant uh, expansions and reworks. 
The most expensive was done in 1998 here at Terminal 18, um, where we doubled the, uh, the acreage, uh, took over a lot of existing businesses, uh, and that made for a, a pretty crazy stormwater infrastructure. Uh, what you're looking at is my actual uh, stormwater plan, my stormwater uh, diagram. The little squares are all catch basins, of which there are roughly 450. Um, I'd like to say I've seen them all, but I haven't. I've, I've had my head in about 230 of them for sure. Um, hey, and, Kelly, can I interrupt? I'm so sorry. Someone in the chat said they can't see your video, and I don't know um, if it's their computer or us. Um, it looks like Eric um, can see it. Can we get like a um, just a, a couple other people commenting whether or not they can see it? I can see it. I see it on two screens. Okay, I can see, I can see. All right, so um, thank you guys. I, I think it's just so, let's see. So Chad, it looks like um, it is just your computer um, and I don't know how to fix that for you. Um, anybody else know how to fix that? And do you know what, what's going on? Do I think? don't, um, but know that we will provide this presentation to everybody um after the fact so if you can't see okay. it right now we can definitely get it to you great and he says no worries I, at least i can hear so um so i apologize for that if it's something on our end um but sorry to interrupt go ahead go ahead kelly no that's quite right and, and chad if you get this presentation and you take a look at it and you you have some questions um, my contact information will be on the end and we can talk um so getting back to the, kind of the infrastructure there are 16 outfalls each one of these uh, black line outlined areas is the corresponding sub basin for the outfall. So these little yellow dots are the actual outfalls. So you can see we've got a lot of area um, and this is really what makes treatment on a facility like this complicated. It's not so much the acreage as it is the number of outfalls that you have to deal with. Um, and so what you see in the colored areas are the phases, which we're gonna talk about later, um, what's, what sub basins were included in the three phases of stormwater treatment uh, that were installed or being installed on the facility. So everything in red happened, uh, is happening now. Yellow was completed in second phase, and, or excuse me, red was the second phase, yellow is happening now, and blue was the first phase. And we'll go into that in a little more detail here as we go. Was there a problem when we started? Yeah, uh, and interestingly enough, a lot of what you see on the screen here, um, uh, different facilities I've been to, um, everybody just kind of took this as what was common. This is normally what was acceptable. There was going to be some garbage on the ground. There was going to be some sheen everywhere. Uh, there was going to be leftover broken down equipment. And who cares if there's a barrel sitting around that we don't know what's in it. Um, and so it was kind of just the, the early days of stormwater, uh, early 2000s, when the permits started ramping up. Uh, and having the requirements for monitoring and corrective action. Um, and people just really needed to understand what that was. Um, and I think for a lot of people, uh, there was a lack of uh, focus on the permit and really learning and understanding it. Um, really some confusion, uh, which still exists today around corrective action timelines. i will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but for our facility, ultimately, we wound up in level three for TSS, which is total suspended solids, and for metals, and in our case, that's copper and zinc. Um, this also triggered about four years of litigation. Uh, Mike was talking about having gone through some consent degrees. We also form formulated a consent degree at the end of that four years of litigation uh, and that was circled around how we would go about installing treatment. This gives you some data on kind of where we were at based on stormwater sampling. This is simply two of the sub basins, two different outfalls, 18 and 14 as an example. Everything in yellow is an exceedance. Um, and you can see that those exceedances were generally averaging out pretty much double of what the zinc is or three times what zinc is. Uh, and uh, copper, not quite nearly as, as severe an exceedance, but very consistent. Uh, 13 out of exa 16 examples uh, are over. So, you know, anywhere to 75 to 95% of the samples were coming out exceeding the benchmark. Now, why did we have so many non-qualifying events? These terminals uh, discharge to the Duwamish River, uh, either East Waterway or West Waterway, depending on where they're situated. And all of our outfalls are at or below mean low or low water. 
Uh, and that means that we are heavily tidally influenced. And in the early uh, periods of this, like you see 2010 range and beyond, uh, the uh, tide gates were not in the best of condition. And so we had a lot of tidal influence coming up through all the pipe. Um, and so we had to have tides below two feet, um, positive two feet, in most cases to get enough flow to actually be able to sample. And I discussed this with the Department of Ecology. You know, I said, do you want me to just dip the standing water? And they said, no, if it's, if it's not flowing, don't sample it, it won't be representative. And so a lot of our sampling in the early days was a mixture of that salt water, or we just simply were not able to take the sampling because we had so much tidal influence. But uh, you know, we started tracking this a little more succinctly after 2014 when I started with SSA, um, but uh, the, the basic pattern continued to be the same regardless of some of the things we implemented simply because of the size of the facility. Um, we were sweeping twice a week. Um, that was a contracted sweeper coming in with a, a vacuum sweeper. Um, <laughs> surprisingly enough, we painted about three miles of fence. I wouldn't recommend that for you. Uh, you know, picture guys walking literally down a chain link fence with rollers. Um, I really don't think that was substantial in reducing our contribution of zinc. Um, and they did the same thing with some of the fencing materials. Um, rumble strips are effective. However, they became a, a, a maintenance issue. Um, they're basically just a bunch of bumps you drive over as you come into the terminal and it will knock a lot of the dirt and mud and so forth off a truck and a chassis that it's towing. But if you don't go out and immediately or periodically keep that swept up at least weekly, uh, you're really not accomplishing anything. You're just isolating where all that's gonna go. And if it spreads beyond where the truck comes in, it's gonna get picked up by other trucks and tracked into the, into the terminal. So rumble strips are great if you really combine them with either a, a wheel wash or if you're really good about staying on top of your maintenance. Um, like a lot of people have done, we did downspout treatment. And I have, uh, I've sampled downspouts uh, before I came to work for SSA, the downspout treatment was already planned. So I was there for the initial installation of that. What I discovered is that no one had actually sampled the discharge off the roof to find out if we had any zinc in it or not. And it turns out we really don't. Um, but a little comical antidote, one of the samples I took, I took a raw sample, in other words, untreated and took a sample that was treated. And uh, it turned out that we were actually creating copper uh, with our treatment system. Uh, once we tore that down, we discovered a copper fitting right in line with the discharge point where we were taking samples. Uh, took that out and lo and behold, we didn't have a copper problem anymore. So moral of the story there is be careful how you put your treatment systems together, understand what they're at. So this is the kind of an overview recap of the entire project. Uh, as I mentioned before, we were in litigation and we uh, settled with a consent degree wherein we planned a five to six year program to install treatment throughout the entire facility. You simply cannot build treatment systems for 16 outfalls on a 200 acre facility in nine months the way the permit would have you do it. Um, it just can't be done. So we broke it into three phases. Um, you can see the phases outlined at the top of the screen. Uh, the areas on the map that are outlined in yellow are the boundaries of the sub-basins that were treated in each phase. So we started here uh, in 2015 with planning and 2016 with uh, actual construction and implementation. Part of the consent degree said that we would address our maintenance areas first. So these three basins, three, 14, and 15, all can have maintenance facilities. This is our CEM shop where we repair containers and chassis. Uh, and this is the power shop down here where all the tractors and UTRs and things like that are worked on. These symbols represent where the actual treatment systems reside within uh, the sub base. And you'll notice they're all very, very close to the water. They're at the very ends, uh, closest we could get, uh, last manhole before the outfall. Uh, we chose this subbasin, subbasin 19, to be part of phase one because it was such a large area and we wanted to tackle uh, you know, a large area with a large system and, and learn as we went about how that system would work. And what happens here in subbasin 19 is we have a major 48 inch line that runs right diagonal right about here. And all the subbasin nine feeds through sub, sub lines into that main, major artery comes down to a treatment system that sits down here, which is really in sub-basin 20. 
And one of the things we discovered in design was that the outfall pipe for this smaller subbasin 20 ran about 100 feet from the outfall uh, where we would pick up subbasin 19. And so it made common sense to just combine those two into one system. So the subbasin 20 feeds into the same system as subbasin 19. When we did that, we got to thinking, well, what if there's other subbasins as we go through this process? We hadn't designed the rest of this yet. We were designing a third of the caramel at a time. So we opted to upsize this treatment system to make sure we had a little extra room in it if we came across another subbasin further on, which uh, turned out to be a really good idea as we got up to phase three and we were addressing the subbasin one that you see up here. This subbasin really didn't afford itself any place to put a treatment system. It would have been right out in the middle of these stacking rows uh, and then extremely problematic. So what we were able to do was just put a flow splitter in to interrupt the discharge for subbasin one, route that over to this 48 inch line and send that down to subbasin 19. So now we have three different subbasins all being treated with one treatment system here. And that was the completion of phase one. So we learned from that when we went into phase two, we said, well, let's see how, how many of these subbasins we can combine put in the fewest number of treatment systems. Why? Well, it's more efficient, costs a little bit less, but really it, you wind up with a lower maintenance uh, issue and cost in O&M. And you also eliminate the above ground displacement of property, container space or operating area on the facility. When we started talking about doing this treatment, uh, we made a fairly extensive matrix of three, 13 or 14 criteria that we weighted and, and for our decision factors of what was most important. What I told my design team was I have three priorities. One, this has to work. You know, we're talking about 30 million plus. I don't want to go back to the board of directors of Carex, which is the parent company of SSA Marine, and tell them I need 10 million more to make it work. Well, we got to get it right the first time. Secondly was displacement of space on the terminal. The finished product needed to have the smallest footprint it possibly could. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're busting at the seams. We're, we've got a backlog of about 5,000 containers now that need to go to the BN rail yard, BN can't take. So we need all the space we can get. Uh, and so we, we needed to combine systems where we could and put in the smallest ones. And the third part was the cost. Um, initial cost is capital, of course, and that's always painful, but the gift that keeps on giving is your O&M. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And, and that was something we looked an awful lot at. In phase two, we decided to combine these three subbasins, seven, eight, and nine. We put a sub uh, treatment system here. And in this phase, we utilized something we hadn't used before, and that was what we call directional drilling or trenchless. We needed to connect a lift station right about here where it was intercepting this discharge for this subbasin, and another one right up about here in subbasin seven and route that to subbasin eight where the treatment system would be. So that's about 1700 linear feet in two sections that we would have had to trench out, excavate, shore, dewater, drop pipe into, and then put all that back. We were able to use directional boring uh, or trenchless where you're actually drilling horizontally under the surface and make the opening and pull the pipe for that connection, uh, heavy duty plastic pipe, uh, and pull that connection through all at once. The excavator, that, that actual operation, just getting that pipe in on each of these only took about three days. It was incredible. Uh, it saved us a tremendous amount of disruption. Uh, all of these areas here are major artilleries, arter, arterials from the container yard out onto the dock where we are unloading the ships. They cannot be blocked off. And so, you know, cutting those trenches and throwing steel plates over them for two days while we work a ship and then coming back and trying to lay the pipe just would have been a nightmare. So that, that directional boring was extremely effective for us. Um, so subbasin 7, 8, and 9 and subbasin 18 were done in phase two. We came back in this year. Last year, we started phase three. Our original intent was to finish phase three in 2020. Uh, the COVID pandemic created a, a number of scheduling issues. So we wound up going to ecology for yet another extension. Uh, to carry us into October of 2021. Um, we're well on our way here in subbasins 10, 13, and 11. Uh, and then subbasin 22, uh, contact just moved down there yesterday and we're getting started there. Uh, and so we're on target to complete the entire facility and have it entirely under 
treatment by 2021, this coming October. Um, you'll notice that there are numbers missing. We don't have a 12, we don't have a six. Uh, that's just the way the numbering took place over years. And as uh, different segments of the terminal were reworked, um, those, those sub-basins were either consumed or combined or the numbers just went away. That's Kelly, kind of overview. just a quick time check. You're, you've got about three minutes to your 20 oh. minutes and then you've got okay. 10 minutes for Q&A. So okay. uh, if you wanna go into your Q&A a little bit, that's fine, but just know. Yep, okay, I'll hustle through what's left. I knew I was gonna get too long in this. Um, big part of construction is big excavations, big holes in the ground, a lot of shoring, a lot of dewatering. Um, a big footprint while we're under construction, very disruptive. We had to reroute traffic. We had to lose container storage space. So be prepared to, for that eventuality if you've got a very large facility. Um, these are some of the systems that we installed. We have a couple of small modular wetland systems and AQIP systems. Both of these are considered passive systems that don't involve any chemicals or electronics. Um, here is a uh, tight sand enhanced sand filtration system. Um, both the sand filtration system and the modular wetlands we incorporated surge tanks. Um, this is a 65,000 gallon surge tank where after kytosan is injected, the um, stormwater sits and, and we can have some of the heavy sediments fall out before they're treated through the sand pods. We didn't do that ahead of the AQIPS and we wish we would have. We should have put these smaller uh, settling tanks ahead of the AQIPS. This kind of gives you a graphic of just examples of how the treatment has impacted our discharge. Uh, you can see coppers come down, um, or excuse me, this is zinc, the zinc line up here down to less than half of the NAL. We're below um, like single digits on copper and great improvement on to, uh, suspended solids as well. A little bit about dollars and cents. I know these are some big scary numbers. Um, what, what I would encourage you to do when you look at numbers, everybody talks about the cost per acre, um, but really it's not so much in the cost per acre where you, where you wanna do an evaluation. If you're looking at one bid or one uh, methodology to use and that associated cost across one facility, then acres, cost per acre, that works. But if you're looking more at comparing one terminal or one facility to another, you've got to look at the number of outfalls because that drives the real cost, those holes in the ground and the number of systems you have to install. Um, you can see here where there are, you know, we have doubling of cost per acre before between these two facilities, but we have a doubling the other way of cost per outfall. So just be mindful of how you're taking your metrics and how you're doing your measurements. Um, we had some big surprises on O&M. Um, the CEF and the modular wetland was pretty close to what uh, we were told they were going to be a little bit higher on the modular wetland. Both the modular wetland and the AQIP, as I mentioned before, are passive systems where you have to do quite a bit of maintenance to the treatment bed. Uh, and we found that we're having to do quite a bit on the AQIP side, not uh, a vendor's problem, not their fault. Uh, we should have put uh, some form of surge tank and pre-settling chambers ahead of that. Uh, so we're having to scrape that upper surface and replace media more frequently than we had intended to. Uh, and we've spent about a year of growing pains trying to get that frequency down. And uh, I think we're going to be in better shape next year. Um, last slide. Be ready to deal with the uh, Department of Ecology's timeline. As I mentioned before, it's fairly unrealistic for what, to, what you need to achieve. Um, if you can characterize your discharge early on, understand what you're dealing with. So we're talking about particulate size. We're talking about um, fractions of dissolved metals versus solids. Um, be familiar as you can with that with your infrastructure. Um, we've encountered a whole bunch of damaged infrastructure on our facility, cracked and broken pipes where we're getting groundwater infiltration. And so if you're getting sampling that doesn't really match up with what your uh, activity is on the surface and what your runoff should be. Uh, you might want to take a look at seeing if you can have somebody come out and do some uh, videotaping of your infrastructure and see if you don't have um, some uh, damaged infrastructure where you're getting groundwater infiltration and you're actually looking at treating groundwater. Um, again, you want to try to stay in business while you're doing this. So if you have a larger facility that you need to keep active while you're installing treatment, you can't simply just shut off part of your business and go do that. That needs to be taken in consideration in your planning and what you propose to ecology as far as a timeline. Um, 
get an early start on your design and permitting. And if you can bring a vendor in, uh, if you've elected a, a particular type of treatment technology, bring that vendor in early on for your design work because they can help you um, work with your uh, engineering team to make sure you're putting the right components in and, and doing the right sizing um, to minimize O&M and consumption of, um, of disposable or consumables. Um, last thing I'm going to tell you, if you'd asked me 10 years ago if sweeping was important, I'd have probably said, eh. I tell you what, it's super important. Um, even after you put, and maybe even so much more after you put a treatment system in, because like I mentioned in these passive systems, if you don't keep them clean, they're going to block up, they're going to be blocked, you're going to go into discharge without treatment, uh, what we call bypass. So don't think that putting treatment systems in mean you can't do your BM, you don't have to do BMPs and uh, your basic uh, sweeping any longer. Uh, you you got to double up on it. So anyway, <clears throat> that's the extent of the time I have, probably a little bit more. I'm open for questions. And then again, there's my contact information. Um, I've had several people visit our terminal uh, that were in uh, the early stages of their own treatment in, uh, installation. So if you're interested in maybe coming by and taking a look at some of this, give me a call. I'd be happy to accommodate you. Do we have any questions? Thank you so much, Kelly. Yeah, if you have a question, please put it in the chat or the Q&A. Well, raise your hand if it's more complicated. Sorry, go ahead, Lisa. No, that's okay. I was just going to say thank you so much, Kelly. You know, some of those little things I love to hear about, like the um, the copper fitting, because it's it's out of sight, out of mind. It's things that people don't think about, and it can really cause a huge problem, right? Um, just knowing your facility and knowing where those sources are coming from is so important. Yeah, we could we could have spent weeks chasing our tail if somebody hadn't thought just to do that, just to take a look at those fittings and see um, you know, yeah. to out why that was on. All right, there's uh, a question. Have... Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, I was gonna say, um, we have a question <laughs> from Eric. Um, do you know what kind of media you use in your AQIP? Uh, not off the top of my head, it's their proprietary media. We haven't, we haven't switched to uh, something separate. Okay. Um, and then there's a question uh, from an attendee. Do, uh, you mentioned you'll be in better shape for next year with the AQIPs. Did you install surge tanks or something to mitigate or did you approach differently? It's a little bit different approach. So initially what we were, we were surprised at how frequently we need to scrape the surface almost every other rain event. Um, and so two things that are happening, we've, we've kind of got a pattern of how to do that so that we're staying ahead of that um, instead of waiting until they do go into bypass. Uh, which in the case of the equips, they simply spill out on the ground, they go right back into the treatment system uh, and, and get recirculated through. So they eventually uh, will get treated, but it's inconvenient to have it sitting there overflowing. Uh, the other piece that uh, we are pushing forward with is to purchase new sweepers. Um, we've been running the same sweeper machines for a long time, they're getting tired. Um, so we're looking at some brand new sweepers and an improved sweeping regimen that will you know, take that load off. Okay, um, next question. What was the source of your turbidity? Um, a lot of what we have uh, for not only turbidity, but zinc as well as tire wear. Um, we have very heavy equipment. I don't know if you've ever been to a main terminal, but if you can picture a, a, a forklift that weighs 100,000 pounds itself, picking up a container that weighs 30,000 pounds and then turning around in its own length. Um, that wears tires tremendously. So we get a very, very fine, almost talcum powder type of uh, dust off of those tires. Uh, and then just the general road dirt that comes in. Uh, winter time, we have uh, containers coming over the pass. Uh, if you've ever been behind a truck that's coming from the pass, you'll see snow packed up underneath it on the back doors and so forth. And miraculously, that stays attached to the container till it gets to my terminal and then it falls off. Oh, and it's, funny, and it's generally black by the time it gets here. All right, are there any other questions for Kelly? All right, we're gonna move on then. Um, thanks again, Kelly, we really appreciate it. And I believe that uh, it's, I can't remember, take, I'm so sorry. Is it Eric? Take a, take a five, let's take a five minute break. Oh, let's sure. switch over okay. to Eric. Uh, so if you guys can come back at 12, 12 11, uh, we'll see you back here. All right, great, thanks.
talk about the somewhat here to talk about the somewhat long and winding road to stormwater compliance that we've had. So oh, Hayes Galvanizing is a hot dip galvanizing job shop, uh, which means that um, Hayes did not galvanize their own fabrications, but rather the material that's brought in by the customers who are mostly steel fabricators, contractors, and government agencies with the occasional artist or fishing boat owner thrown in. Hot dip galvanizing produces a zinc coating on iron and steel products by immersion of the material in a bath of liquid zinc, as you see in the photo on the right. Hayes has been operating in the same location in unincorporated King County, just south of the Seattle city limits since 1964. When I started working here in 1984, there were still a couple acres of uh, lettuce uh, fields across the street owned by the Desimone family. So if any of you have been around for a while, you know that's <clears throat> it's been quite a while now. So even though we've been here for quite a while, uh, hot tip galvanizing has been in Duwamish Valley quite a bit longer than that. Um, these photos here were taken at uh, um, somewhere from Ace, but some are from Jorgensen Forge, which uh, used to be uh, just south of Boeing plant number two on the Duwamish. So the galvanizing industry has been here for quite a while. So hot tip galvanizing is a, a highly sustainable process. Um, the material can be completely recycled after at the end of the supply cycle, and our facility is a no discharge facility um, as far as uh, discharging to the sanitary sanitary sewer. So that's kind of a uh, accomplishment for a metal finishing plant. Um, we're covered by any ICS code three three two eight one two, which is metal coating, engraving, and allied services, and um, we have thirty five to fifty employees, depending on the number of shifts. Currently, we're running at the low end of that. Um, our production was built in 1963. And as we'll see uh, coming up, uh, that there's a couple things about that that are not ideal from a pollution prevention standpoint. So, so um, we started monitoring for um, our stormwater in 2003. And uh, we have the usual industrial stormwater general permit uh, monitoring requirements, divinity, pH, oil, sheen, zinc, and copper, and a, a couple more that they uh, throw in for, um, for uh, uh, metal fabricators, petroleum hydrocarbons, um, and uh, let's see, I've got my window in the way. Oh yeah, and lead, that's right. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a, real quickly about the process to show you what we do here. Um, the first step is an arrival inspection where, um, you have to look at the material and make sure that it has holes so any enclosed sections can fill and drain because they have to fill and drain with the zinc and cleaning chemicals. Uh, the next, next steps are all um, chemical uh, cleaning steps. We have large dip tanks um, full of caustic soda, et cetera. The first step is caustic soda cleaning, which is uh, sodium hydroxide at 10 to 12%. Uh, these tanks are heated. This one is usually heated to 180 degrees. Uh, then there's a rinse tank um, to keep caustic from carrying over to the acid tank. Uh, then there's a pickling step where um, we soak the material in a bath of 10 to 12 percent sulfuric acid at 145 to 150 degrees, and that lifts off any mill scale or rust. Um, that's followed by another rinse tank, the acid rinse tank. Um, then there's a preflux tank. Uh, preflux is zinc ammonium chloride solution. Um, which is a triple salt. And the purpose for that is it keeps the, the iron from uh, flash rusting or oxidizing while it's uh, waiting to be galvanized. Um, it also promotes the formation of alloy layers uh, between the iron and the zinc. It's not just a two layer system. Um, when you um, galvanize something, there's actually alpha, beta, delta, and gamma layers in between uh, the iron and the zinc. Um, then there's a dipping step um, where you immerse, you pick up the material with uh, large grains and dip it in the galvanizing kettle. Um, as we're pulling it up, um, we have people that skim the um, um, skimmings draw, uh, material away from the iron so that it doesn't get included in the uh, coatings. 
Um, our galvanizing kettle is 44 feet long, four feet wide and five feet deep, and it's um, heated to uh, 830 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's quite hot. Um, following that, there's a filing and finishing step where we have people that um, um, remove any drip marks from the material and where the material has been lifted with chains, um, they'll file the chain marks off. Um, unfortunately, this is conducted in close proximity to a couple of storm drains and we'll see that uh, this causes a problem. Um, then there's a quality assurance step where we test the thickness of the coating to make sure uh, it meets a specification. Um, the main galvanizing specification is ASTM A123. And um, sometimes we um, use other specifications as well, depending on the customer requirements. So when we started um, testing our stormwater in 2003, uh, as you can imagine, uh, zinc was uh, quickly the main issue. And uh, as it turns out, wherever there's zinc, there's relatively smaller amounts of uh, copper and lead too. So those were all problems. Uh, our untreated stormwater also has um, uh, plenty of turbidity. Uh, we have a lot of traffic, uh, maybe not quite as much as uh, uh, the uh, terminal at SSA Marine, but we have uh, forklifts and, and semis coming and going uh, all day long. So um, that creates a surprising amount of, of uh, turbidity for the stormwater. Um, when we first started testing our stormwater, you can see we got some really uh, ridiculous uh, uh, numbers for zinc. Um, you know, if you, um, those of you who have uh, been doing stormwater uh, sampling for a while and have tried to trace down minor sources of zinc, um, you can only imagine that, uh, you know, a galvanizing plant, you multiply that problem times a thousand, and uh, this is kind of what you, you get. Um, you can see that uh, I think the all-time record was 130,000 parts per million. That's 130 milligrams per liter. So that's pretty much, uh, um, I mean, and not all of that is dissolved, obviously. So the samples in those days um, were untreated. So where does all this uh, zinc come from? Of course, the first step in uh, trying to um, do your source control is determining where uh, all the zinc is coming from for us. Um, and number one is galvanized material stored uncovered in the yard while awaiting shipment. Um, a lot of our material is very big, 40 to 60 foot long um, pipe and beams and such. So it's, um, and it doesn't sit there for very long. So covering it is uh, really not an option. Um, that filing and finishing operation I mentioned, um, you can see that uh, uh, left to their own devices, the filers will file in close proximity to, to the drain. And if they're not constantly cleaning up, covering the drain and cleaning up after themselves, you can see on the ground there, that's all zinc filings. Galvanizing fixtures and racks uh, stored, un stored uncovered in the yard. Um, these are racks that have um, last come out of the preflux tank and that preflux triple salt um, has a high amount of zinc in it. It's maybe 40% zinc. Uh, so there is a certain residue of that that uh, stays on the uh, racking and fixtures. Uh, and if those are left outside uh, in the rain, uh, that will definitely cause a major issue. Um, transport of materials around the facility, kettle skimmings and dross. Um, kettle skimmings, that's the material that rises to the surface of the galvanizing kettle, dross sinks to the bottom. Both of those are saleable byproducts that are sold uh, so the, the um, sink can be re-smelted. Uh, iron salt, uh, ferrous sulfate, that's removed in large amounts from the uh, sulfuric acid tank. It's a byproduct of pickling and that is also a saleable byproduct. And we make several hundred thousand pounds a year of, uh, of that material. So it's always being moved around the plant. So you have to be really careful in transporting all these materials um, so that you don't uh, um, get residue uh, that ends up in the storm drain. Um, just picking up a pallet of bags like you see in the photo, it's really easy for a forklift driver to accidentally puncture one of the bags when they're trying to get the forks into the pallet. Um, and of course, if you have a wrapped pallet like that, um, it just kind of, and you puncture the bottom row of bags, it just literally dribbles all the way across the yard. And the only way to fix that is to unwrap the pallet and restack it, 
<laughs> so that the leaking bag is now on top. So um, another source of zinc was the bag house dust removal process. Um, the bag house captures the um, um, air pollution coming off of the kettle, the particles, and uh, that is mostly zinc oxide. So we had to enclose the bag house to uh, try to keep, uh, keep that in hand. Um, also tracking material from the building on forklift uh, uh, tires or shoes. Um, if people come and go from the building and have material on their on their forklift tires or shoes, that's going to um, get all over the yard. Uh, deteriorating paving pavement, um, cracks in asphalt and concrete can uh, trap zinc particles, and um, sometimes the pavement coatings um, can also be high in zinc. Oil leaks and particles from forklifts and customer trucks. Uh, um, I'd like to echo what Kelly said about uh, forklift tires. You know, if you can think about a heavy forklift counterweight sitting on top of the stair axle and you have a powerful hydraulic motor, you can literally turn that lock to lock and just grind those tires into the pavement. Um, there have been times here around the plant when it, it hasn't been swept, you can literally, literally see waves of forklift tire dust <laughs> rolling across the pavement. And uh, that's a serious issue. I mean, it's not our major source of zinc, but it's a lot of people's uh, major source of zinc. And uh, there has been new studies that show that um, there's a um, anti-wear agent in tires that is responsible for a lot of uh, fish mortality. So I expect we'll be seeing, hearing more about that in the future. Okay, here's one that really irritates a, uh, a forklift, a stormwater person uh, running over cans of sink rich paint. Uh, this has happened here in a couple of a couple of times. The uh, pilers carry cans of touch-up paint on their forklift. Sometimes or have been known to carry those on their forklift. It falls off the forklift and then they run it over. And then what you end up with a stain that's uh, literally impossible to remove. It just wears away over time and deposits a uh, sink in the storm drain. So uh, that's one that'll uh, really drive a stormwater program coordinator bonkers. So obviously we started with doing the uh, operational and structural source control. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through this because it really didn't do the trick for us. I mean, there are, all these things are necessary. And uh, I would also like to uh, um, back up Kelly, what he said that uh, sweeping and things like that are definitely uh, uh, important even after you get uh, treatment systems installed. But um, what, we, uh, what we end up having to do was um, first, in order to treat the stormwater, let me uh, see if I can get a hope back up here. So the outfall, here's the production building, and here's South 96th Street over here. This was our original outfall for most of the stormwater on the plant. There was a second one up here that I'll talk about later, but this was the main outfall, and this is also the most heavy, heavily polluted area for the stormwater because that's where that filing and finishing operation is. All the galvanized material uh, comes out of the plant right here and all the galvanized uh, material awaiting shipment is stored in this area here. So what we had to do was build a lift station here and another one on this end of the building at the south end of the building. And there's a, we installed a surge tank back here and another AQIP like uh, they had uh, at Kelly's facility there. So, and there's a trench drain that channels around all the way around the building that channels water to these, these um, catch basins that were turned into lift stations. So, so this was uh, version one of our treatment system where we had a, this was like a 2000, 2007. Um, and we got this um, bed of different media and a surge tank that um, collects the water and allows some separation of the solids to occur before it um, gets to the, to the tank. And uh, since we had one of the original ones and have been doing this forever, uh, um, and I never signed a no disclosure agreement, I'll, I can tell you exactly what's in it. Um, there's an eight inch lever, layer of gravel at the bottom. There's six inches of activated carbon. And for us, for zinc removal, we originally used a six inch layer of activated alumina um, followed by six inches of sand. Now, when we went to treatment system version two, uh, we and installed an ion exchange system, 
we ended up getting rid of the alumina because we were um, using the ion exchange media to remove the zinc. Um, the sand, uh, we went with two layers of sand, coarse, and, uh, coarse on the top, fine on the bottom, and um, we ended up uh, beefing up the uh, carbon layer as well. So after the, the first layer of treatment, you can see that um, you know, this is kind of a magnification of the 2007 to 2010 version of that, uh, representing the period of time when we had the uh, first version of our treatment system. And you can see that it's uh, definitely a lot lower than in the previous one, but um, at best we're flirting with the um, benchmark level. And at worst, we had some major exceedances. Now only part of this is the problem of the treatment technology. There's another issue, which I'm gonna to have to explain. Um, but before I do that, uh, look for level two uh, of our treatment system, we, um, added a pre-filter, which is a um, Stormwater RX, who's the vendor that makes the AQIP. Uh, they call it a Retenu, and it's a typical construction site pre-filter system. Here, it's here on the left in the picture. Um, and it is, has three tanks uh, pulled with sand. And the, the thing about this is you can backwash it. Uh, we have a separate tank to collect the backwash water where the uh, heavy solids can settle out. Uh, the problems that Kelly mentioned about an AQIP um, being a, a maintenance headache uh, was very true for us. Um, what happens is you get a surface of the filter gets blinded by the biggest particles and just a thin layer of material can keep water from getting into the lower uh, levels of the material. So after we added the, um, the pre-filter system, then the only the particles that were left would all get taken out in the depth of the filter so we can maintain a good flow rate for much longer. So that was uh, one key. Um, the other key was um, installing an ion exchange system on the end, which uh, has been really great for us. It has a really, uh, the ion exchange resin has a really large metals holding capacity and is uh, capable of uh, uh, giving us uh, numbers uh, under the benchmark consistently. So the, the amount of zinc we had in our monitoring samples with treatment system version one, you know, you can see it's better than it used to be at least. Um, treatment system version two, after we installed the uh, ion exchange, you can see that we're um, often down here in the low levels, but we still have some excursion, some high excursions up here. In order to get down here where we are today, we had to do a major uh, version, which I'll describe here. Um, one of the complicated things about this site, um, here between ACE Galvanizing and Highway 509, this hillside has all kinds of springs and seeps, and a lot of water uh, runs down the hill uh, towards the plant. And so in order to keep that from running on or under the asphalt, there's a trench here around the east edge of the plant, and then there's a cistern right about here. And when the cistern gets full, it overflows to catch basin six right here, catch basin seven right there, and then catch basin nine right here. And this is the second outfall that I mentioned um, when I was uh, showing the diagram earlier. Um, the problem here is that stormwater that goes into catch basin seven, six and seven right here, um, leaves the site untreated. So after, excuse me, after we installed the treatment system, rather than having the outfall of treatment system be our monitoring location, we had to monitor catch basin nine, which is the last the location where all the water from the plant mingles before it leaves the site. Um, in order to get to where we could use the outfall of the treatment system as our monitoring location, we had to first um, construct something to divert the flow, the storm water, the, run on flow from the hillside so that that can pass through without um, mingling with the stormwater. So what we did was we um, built a lift station uh, in this area right here um, with had two sections in it. One section, the water from, that's basin, uh, from the um, overflow from the cistern passes through. And the other section, um, 
we took the water, the storm water that gets in there, um, and it uh, gets pumped by the lift station into a large surge tank. And that surge tank, as it fills up, it has an orifice that discharges through a trench that we built along along this area here, and then a pipe that goes along here, and then um, another trench that goes across the driveway, and from there to the lift station here. So after we finally accomplished that, all the stormwater from the plant was being treated. Um, so then we could um, we could eliminate um, uh, sampling in catch basin nine with untreated stormwater. Uh, so that's what allowed us to, excuse me, let me back up a slide. Uh, after we did that, then we were consistently meeting the benchmark. And that has only been since um, about the third quarter, third or fourth quarter of 2007. So we finally got all that done. Now, there's a couple other projects that it uh, uh, took to make this happen. Um, this lower yard in this area right here, um, we uh, had to refurb that and we have an infiltration basin that we added along the sides uh, and the, the north and the east sides of this lower yard, the side here, and this side here that percolates most of the water. Um, we trenched across this part of this uh, sloped driveway and diverted that to the same uh, treatment channel that goes to treatment. And um, we also, uh, see, here's that surge tank I was talking about for the, uh, for the lift station that's at Catch Basin 6. And later, late, I think it was a 2019, uh, stormwater inspectors had us add a, this was 2018, 2019, stormwater inspectors had us add another monitoring location here on the east driveway. This is like about a 3,600 uh, square foot driveway that discharged to the street. So we ended up having to trench across that and then have another, a fourth lift station that also pumps the water back up to the treatment. So these, with these additions, um, uh, we are sure glad that we uh, oversized the treatment system uh, originally because we would have been in the position of having to build another uh, treatment system. So what's worked for us? Um, well, we love that backwashable sand filter. Um, as Kelly said, uh, the uh, AQIP can be a real maintenance headache if you don't uh, remove solids over a certain size. I think the uh, retinue that we have, I think it pretty much gets rid of uh, everything of, above about 75 microns. So, and then right after that, it goes through the AQIP and through two canister filters before it goes to the ion exchange, the last of which is one, one micron. So there's literally zero turbidity left um, by the time the uh, stormwater gets to the ion exchange system. Uh, that ion exchange works really good for metals removal and has really uh, high metals um, holding capacity. Um, having two ion exchange tanks is uh, really helpful because um, although the second one, it, they're in series, it goes through one and then it goes through the other one. Um, although the second one is now our monitoring location, we sample that and uh, do our monitoring. Uh, the one in between, we test that one for zinc and by comparing those two numbers, we can tell um, how our um, how they're loading up with zinc and which one. Sometimes you can just change the media in just one tank instead of two. And since it it, it can cost twelve to fourteen thousand dollars to change the media uh, for one tank, um, it really helps to uh, not have to do both of them if you don't have to. Something else that works really good for us: um, having your own sweeper and vector truck. Uh, we bought a um, right on sweeper uh, off of eBay. And that's been really good. And we found this funky old uh, factor truck on, on some really strange, uh, it was really a strange little vehicle that we uh, took and took the factor unit off of it and made it a skid mounted unit. And so we have the ability to clean our, clean our storm drains without having to call a contractor. So that's really been helpful. Uh, what didn't work for us? Well, uh, stormwater source control, it didn't actually work as far as, uh, getting us uh, below the zinc benchmark, but it's um, it's still really necessary to um, uh, keep the loading down on your treatment train. You know, it's a lot easier to sweep material off the ground than it is to remove it from the water later. And uh, 
it's literally all got to go before it uh, it leaves the pipe at the end of the treatment drain. Um, so another thing, uh, the bed style sand filters, uh, what we learned that they often need pre-treatment for particulate removal. Um, like I say, I, I think I'll say it one more time. Uh, it can be a real maintenance headache. You know, you, you know, you look in there uh, expecting to see uh, stormwater uh, uh, going through at a good rate, and it's getting ready to overflow because uh, the, the filter's blinded. So uh, proper pre-treatment uh, is a real, real help. The backwash bowl sand filter at the front um, is automatic, uh, so it requires no user intervention. We've had it going for two or three years now, and I'm just getting ready to change the media for the first time. So that one's really good. Um, for the challenges and lessons learned, uh, I would say follow that um, level one, level two, level three process. Start with your source control. Um, give it your best effort each time. Um, watch your deadlines. Um, you don't want to get into those second and third exceedances. Um, if you could avoid it, that's going to kick you into the to the next level, um, but sometimes treatment is the only thing that's going to work. Um, I suppose it should be obvious um, when you look at a galvanizing plant and all those zinc that we have around that uh, uh, it was going to come to that in the end. Um, well, so we learned that I <laughs> exchange media is expensive, uh, but media holds a lot of metals and uh, also keep up with system maintenance. Um, the, the, all the systems are only going to do their job if uh, if you do the proper maintenance on them. A lot of the vendors have uh, have um, maintenance manuals. They tell you exactly what you need to do to keep them in good operating shape, and those need to be incorporated in your um, BMPs um, and need to be documented. So, um, inflammation cost. I'm sorry, I don't have really good. Um, uh, data on this. Uh, a lot of some of the stuff has been a quite a while since we bought it. Um, I know we're well over three hundred thousand uh, on our small site since two thousand seven. Uh, o and M cost per square foot uh, basis. Uh, here again, there again, I'm just guessing, but I think it's um, between two and three thousand dollars per year per acre. Uh, most of that for ion exchange media, but uh, we frequently change the canister filters that are. Uh, couple hundred bucks a pop too. So sum it up, um, the bottom line is that, um, you know, um, we all would uh, like to have that Duwamish River where we could uh, uh, go fishing and catch those big kings again. Uh, we all used to go uh, fishing in the Delta Marine Salmon Derby uh, down there at the end of South 96. Uh, and uh, this uh, fish on the right, uh, that's on the left is Don Schroeder, our old foreman. On the right is uh, Jeff is uh, good. And I believe that uh, 25 pound king on the right got second place back in 2012. So we would uh, like to have the river clean again so that we can do that. So um, if, if we can do that, all the um, expense and uh, hassle of uh, uh, dealing with our stormwater would, would be worth it. So uh, thank you for your time. And uh, with that, we'll uh, take any questions you might have. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation, Eric. Um, I loved the historic photos. Um, I always love to see historic photos of those um, facilities. So thank you for sharing those. Um, we have a couple of questions already, but um, I'm gonna ask that if people have um, questions, they put them in the Q&A. Um, and let's see, uh, how often do you sweep? Um, well, literally, whenever it's uh, dry outside, uh, we got we okay. have somebody running running the sweeper. Uh, we don't like doing it when it's uh, when it's raining, but other than that, uh, we have somebody on there all the time. Okay, that yeah, that sounds great. And then, can you explain the use of the surge tank for treatment? Well, the surge tank, um, it's uh, basically it accumulates the water, and the tank will have a on and off um, uh, float float in it. So when it gets when it gets to the top float. Um, the pump turns on and pumps it through the treatment train. Um, when it gets to the bottom, it turns it off and then it accumulates water in the meantime. But it doesn't, it, there's a couple of feet below the off level of the pump. So that allows a lot of settling to occur okay. uh, and stuff, right? Yeah, great. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I was just. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, are there any other questions? There was one. Uh, does the system function when the power goes out? 
Oh, there it is. Yes. Okay. Um, no, the system uh, is is dependent on on um, on the pumps that uh, lift lift the storm water. So that is uh, kind of a flaw in the program. Um, we have a limited uh, generator capacity on the plant, but it's um, it's um, I believe you know I do believe that the generator does operate the the pumps at the north end of the building and will lift it up to the storm water system. So it will. Get some settling that would go on. Um, we have not had much problem with that um, um, in much, but anyway, yeah, that is that is uh, technically uh, a problem that uh, might need to be addressed. Great, thank you. And you know, I'm going to ask Kelly that same question: Does your system function when the power goes out at your facility, or do you have, you must have some kind of backup generators that that come on for your facility? Yeah, the backup generators are generally uh, dedicated to all of our security systems and uh, okay. general operating systems. Um, but we can't run our cranes or anything else. So the uh, we've had one very short power outage since we've had these units on. Uh, and there's so much capacity in our infrastructure. Um, there wasn't a lot of discharge that continued to happen. Fortunately, it wasn't raining real heavy at the time. Uh, okay. Great, thank you. Are there any other, oh, here, there's a question. We do have a, yep. yeah. um, we started cleaning all the sumps and zinc levels were reasonable, but the latest testing was extremely high for zinc. Any ideas what might cause this? That's a good question. Well, without looking at your particular site, it would be, uh, it would be hard to say, uh, you know, I mentioned, uh, um, but not about seven seven sources of zinc we have here, but um, every place is different. Um, but definitely, um, uh, tire dust uh, probably does it for for a lot of people. Um, you know, ob obviously, if there's any galvanized material uh, around fencing, um, handrails, uh, stuff, uh, we find a lot of our uh, customers are uh, actually doing duplex coatings where you paint over the galvanizing. Um, but you kind of have to think of that uh, from the get go when you're you're first installing the material, but um, yeah, you need to do a good survey and, and find your find your sources. It could Thank be you. if the samples were taken very close to the when the cleaning was done that you just mobilized some oh, yeah. material that was settled in the catch basin in that bottom curve, and now you've kicked it up. Um, so it could be just a one time hit that you're seeing. Um, once you get in, you start stirring stuff that's been sitting there for six to ten or twenty years, however long it's been there. You can mobilize some of that. Right. Good point. There's one more question in the chat, Lisa. Yeah, I see that. Let's see. Um, what about copper sources? Is that that must be just a general like where is your copper coming from? Well, you know, we we've never actually determined where the copper was coming from, but anything that we do to um, take care of the zinc is also taking care of the copper at the same time. Um, we stopped having um, uh, zinc exceedances of the benchmark. Um, Right away, just um, you know, settling settling out the solids and and doing the level one filtration or the, the first version of our treatment system, we pretty much stopped having uh, um, exceedances of copper. Um, so we never we never actually did determine that, but um, but uh, it's it seems to be easier to remove for us to remove than uh, the zinc because we have so much zinc. Yeah, you get copper and brake dust. Brake pads have copper. There's a there's a no copper brake pad law in Washington now. I'm not sure if it's fully enacted yet, but a lot of manufacturers are are still catching up to that. Uh, but there's still a lot of vehicles out on the road that are, they're coming to your facilities um, with copper in the brake pads. So if there's stop and go traffic on your on your facility, that's where some of it's going to be coming from. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Any other questions for Eric? Okay, I think we will move on to Mike. Do you need some time to put up your uh, your presentation? It was, let's take a quick four minute bio break. Okay. Uh, come back at 12.50. All right, great, thank you. Okay, it's 12.50. Um, Mike, our, do you wanna take over and talk about Rainier Petroleum? Happy to. Everybody hear me okay? 
I'll take that. Yes. Yes, I hope. Um, yeah, um, Rainier Petroleum. I think we have uh, four facilities here in the Northwest. We operate along the West Coast and our parent company operates all over the nation. Uh, the picture you're looking at right here is our facility here at uh, Pier 15 to give you an idea where we're where we are. If you can't tell by the city in the in the background is is if you look over here to uh, to the upper right hand corner, you can see those cranes and those containers. That's Kelly's place that he was describing uh, earlier in his great presentation. So so we're we're right next door. Uh, we've got the Duwamish River that runs off both sides of us here, or through the uh, east and west waterways, and uh, what we're what you're looking at here is our facility. We got a warehouse. We got a few storage tanks. We got a about a 600 foot fuel dock out there, uh, and we've got barges that we operate. Um, you know, while we're on this picture, because there's so much here that, that we've been talking about, people were talking about the the tires. Both Kelly and Eric brought up, you know, the tire stuff. And if you look over here in the, I don't know if you can see my little cursor, but you can see the all how all of our all of our trucks come in and they turn and they leave that that tire dust that you could see. You know, a little bit of their tire comes off, forklifts, all that other stuff. But uh, just while we're on that picture, I want to point that out. A um, little bit about our company. We uh, we're operating on the north end of Harbor Island, right there on Elliott Bay. Uh, we're in between a shipyard and a container terminal, which is Terminal 18, which you guys just saw. We've got about an acre of land uh, in the upland area here at this facility, um, and about about a half acre on our finger pier. Warehouse, which is all contained, tank farm, which is all contained, containing biodiesel, lube oils, and well, some of those tanks now are uh, stormwater retention. Uh, so we we're storing stormwater. Uh, we use our use the area for our truck fleet parking as well. About right here, we um, our maritime fuel supplier. We have about forty five people. We supply fuel lubricants to the maritime industry. We basically, if it floats, it's our customer. Uh, it, we got the ferries, uh, Washington State ferries, King County foot ferries, tugs, cruise ships, passenger vessels. Container ships, tankers, fishing vessels, and we've already talked about a little bit about the, the truck fleet that we operate in barges. So it's not just at our facilities; we go, we go all over, and uh, we service our customers at our facilities, but also at, at their locations. Uh, we do dockside fueling here at our pier. I think we do about sixteen hundred vessels uh, a year come to our pier for fuel and lubricants. You can see the. The, we, we usually do uh, some pre-booming for them for doing the transfers. Uh, one thing we do really well is in uh, spill spill prevention, spill preparedness and response. We, we long thought of ourselves as having a really good environmental stewardship um, uh, when it comes to moving oil. I mean, I think we've had a, just wrote, done, did some analysis between 2008 and 2020. We did the, over 330,000 oil transfers over the water almost a billion gallons transferred and less than a half gallon made it to the water. But what, what we're gonna get into is, hey, while well, you thought you were good in one area, well, we, we didn't understand how rain worked. And then that got us in trouble, which, which, which we'll go into. We also go to, go to the places. Um, the photo on your, on your left happens to be right at Terminal 18. So that's our truck. And we give uh, lub lubricating oils to the big container ships. The, the one on your right is a, some of you guys who are in the area uh, can probably recognize it as a car deck of a Washington State Ferry. Um, so what it is, we that's our tank vessel right there. And so we'll deliver fuel to their locations. Now, getting back to the stormwater, 2015 and prior, we had a fundamental lack of understanding how, how rain works. We didn't understand the environmental importance of stormwater and, and paying attention to it. Um, and it is an issue from an environmental point of view. We totally missed the nuances of the rules and we really blew the repercussions of non-compliance. Non you know, we didn't, we didn't get the fact that, hey, this is, this is important stuff uh, from an environmental point of view and from a running your business point of view. There, so in 2015, we triggered a level three corrective action for copper and a level two for zinc. 
these are our 2015 um, uh, benchmark benchmark, benchmark uh, exceedances for copper and zinc. As you can tell, they're they're high, but they're not. It's not like we're blowing it out of the water. We a lot of pollution wasn't coming out of our yard. But what what we weren't doing also, in addition to triggering the level uh, threes, was was doing all the other nuances of the rules. Uh, for instance, we were submitting our discharge monitoring reports by, by snail mail long after the Department of Ecology could even take those things. Uh, so we'd have it all stamped, we'd, we'd send in the paperwork or we wouldn't do the paperwork. That got us in trouble. And that led to consent decree, actually two consent decrees. And the image that I chose here is kind of like how I felt going through the, through the consent decrees. Um, I was hired to, to take care of the consent decrees and I didn't know anything about rain uh, and stormwater at the time. But one of the first things I did is went to Ann's uh, ECOS class and that was a great place to start. Um, I kind of likened the consent decree and it is kind of a war in which it, your enemies only made arrows and you only made a shield and you could block a hundred arrows. Uh, but if one of them happened to just scratch your ankle, you would drop like Achilles. Uh, so the, the penalties for non-compliance are very, very steep. And so you can only block so many shots. Um, we had the consent decrees. We, we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, so we, we capitulated to a whole bunch of things. So treatment system, sure, what kind do you want? It, it wasn't the right kind in the, de in the decree. So, so we had to do some renegotiating. We had to capture peer watch. Sure, we could capture peer watch. What's entailed with doing that? Uh, we didn't understand. Um, installing tank farm floor, we rerouted gutters. We did other, like, like 20 other to do's, I think 24 was the number of items that we had to do for our consent decree. And I think uh, some people already talked about, Kelly already talked about some unrealistic timelines. We didn't understand how long it was gonna take us to do all of this stuff. So it, it, was, it was challenging to say the least. Um, we did, I think, I think our total costs for the settlements, that's the up, up front costs, not the continuing costs, was about two and a half million dollars. Uh, that's what the legal cost, the, the settlement, which for us in our little area, postage stamp of land there was a big deal. Um, but uh, we also have not only ongoing costs, but we, we spent money on voluntary measures, which ended up being much higher. Um, we, we looked at ourselves and, you know, business like us moving oil uh, to our customer base, our environmental, uh, how well we handle our environmental stewardship also affects the bottom line of our business. So we looked really hard at what we could do to clean up our image as well as clean up our stormwater. This is our, uh, one of our port mandated projects. This is our treatment system. You got uh, some, uh, some bags over here, um, uh, 25 micron bag filters, which is the first stage after settling. You got some um, one micron cartridge filters, and then you got some carbon media, uh, which is, I think Eric mentioned the, the, the backflow, the backwash ability. These got this, and that, that's really, really important. Uh, we also, uh, I think Eric talked about a little bit about the importance of settling and and kelly mentioned settling we did the same we made the same mistake we didn't pay enough attention to making sure the settlement and we were going through filters which is increasing our cost but it was also just hey somebody's got to go change the filters in the stormwater system so what we ended up having to do is alter the engineering uh engineering plan later on to add some some more settling stages to it before it went into there um, not just for turbidity cut down the turbidity but to, to make the system work a little better capturing the dock water which is the image on the uh, right was 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 very difficult i don't think it had ever been done at the time which, which we were doing it some other places were having to do it concurrently but everybody was kind of going from scratch we uh, have an old pier as you can see this is the underside of it it's a hundred year old, primarily old uh, wooden pier, though as time goes on, less creosote, more, more 
steel piles, more concrete piles. There's even some, some plastic piles, which happen to be all the rage at the time. But we had to capture all the water from the pier. Uh, before, every little hole in the pier, and there was probably about 70 or 80 holes in the pier, um, we had to capture those. Uh, but at a cost of like $5,500 per hole, we had to decide which holes we needed to capture and which ones we could plug. So that was the first step. It was really trying to figure out what we could uh, could live with and what we couldn't. So that was a big stage after a while. That, that, was, that was the longest one. I think we blew the, uh, the timeline on quite a few of them, but that one, that one took quite a bit longer. But at the end of the day, we managed to capture all of it through a, uh, a system of, of uh, capture and convey it to shore. We'll get a little bit back to that. We'll get to some drainage pictures, but we also had to do some impervious floor on our tank farm, which was well overdue and a, a good thing. Keeps, keeps oil out of the groundwater if it were to happen. This is our basic facility in the upland area. One catch basin, much easier than Kelly's or Eric's, especially Kelly's who's got catch basins all over. Everything kind of drained to one thing. We had to do some, some grading and some, you know, redirectional so flow, but it pretty much went in the upland area to the catch basin anyway. So all we had to do was put in a treatment system. Uh, you can see some tanks. Those are the numbers right, right over here in this part right here. And some of those I've said are now are, are now storm water. So we, we retain. So if the power were to go off, there's some questions about power. Uh, and if, if you lost power, what would happen? Well, one, our sweeping alone, we meet the benchmarks. We just increased our sweeping. And even before our treatment system was online, we were passing benchmarks just by going nuts on sweeping. And we still are going nuts on sweeping because Eric points out, it cuts down on your maintenance of the rest of your, your, your treatment system. So we're continuing to do that. But we also store the, the product in, or the oil, uh, the, excuse me, the uh, storm water, we retain it. So we have the ability to retain storm water without, without pumping it in during rain events without power. This was the Pier 15 dock. This is the finger pier. It looks like there's two piers, but it isn't. The bottom one is the, the north section. So it just kind of fits on the, fits on the other one. And we did, I think, Here's another slide. Yes, this one here is our total facility and all these shaded areas are where we, where our water goes. But in a nutshell, every water on our facility, whether it's upland or on the, our, the pier that we operate, it's captured and conveyed to a combination of our treatment system or where necessary to the sanitary sewer system through permits. And that in itself is a challenge if you haven't dealt with King County or the city of Seattle, wherever you're at, trying to trying to get the permission to pump more storm water into an already taxed sanitary sewer system. Um, but it's achievable if you if you get on it early with the right people. Uh, we also did a lot of voluntary projects, which we didn't have to do. We we're kind of killing two birds with one stone. Um, we had an old container full of emergency spill response. It was kind of rusty made a mess so we replaced that and put it on wheels now you got a nice emergency spill response container with all the stuff it's much more usable and it gets rid of some of your sources of copper and zinc uh forklift tires were, were huge so we put our, our pumps our hoses our our um some of our spill response materials rather than on pallets on easily movable uh covered totes so you can run them up and down the dock we got some uh, new, we rerouted the, the picture here of the building. That's our warehouse. Uh, we did some zinc free coating on the roof. Uh, we rerouted the stormwater gutters and, and a number of other things. We also, since we don't operate just at our location, at our facilities, we partnered with the Port of Seattle on, on, a, on a few things. This happens to be Pier 91, uh, which is across the bay a port owned, owned facility, we installed a uh, fuel platform here, which is fully contained. And 
it goes to sanitary sewer uh, under a permit. So all the storm water, any drips, where previously these were these were transfers conducted to equipment outside a containment where it could impact storm uh, water uh, and the legal ramifications of that and the cost ramifications of that. So we put in a platform for them that helps reduce their chances of exposure. And we built a vessel, uh, about $7 million uh, plus on a vessel that replaces uh, about 16, take, takes about 16 trucks off the road, lowers greenhouse gas emissions uh, by a factor of 20 to 40 and eliminates stormwater impacts. Uh, why am I telling you all of this stuff is because we got back to trying to get our, not only to get our customer base, to get, to get a warm fuzzy from us, but also to, hey, we're, we're spending a lot of money on this environmental stuff. And we want it to be sustainable. We want it to be uh, a long-term thing, not just, not just get the regulators off, off your, off your case, not just get the, the courts off your case, but let's really make a change. Um, and the best way to do that is to make that for sustainability to work, which big profitable. And uh, that, that created some marketing opportunities for us. And we've been able to bring a business focus to our stormwater management and the rest of our environmental program, which, which had previously lacked. Um, so far, so good. Uh, being able to treat the storm water. We have now have had uh, 22 consecutive quarters without a benchmark exceeded for any pollutant parameter. Uh, so that, that's huge. We didn't have the, the huge daunting task that, that some other people have. Our, our, our pollutant levels weren't skyrocketing to begin with. Um, our regulatory compliance has improved dramatically. We have had four inspections, regulatory inspections, some by the EPA, but a lot by ecology too. And it's hard to get those guys to walk out of your facility without without a violation. Um, I went to an NEDC stormwater conference and a couple of their inspectors were up there talking. And they had done like 97 inspections together over a course, I think it was a year, but only three of them ended up with out of violation being issued. And so if you get a little violation, but that's a public record, so it can go to to some of the watchdogs, which now puts you on a target list for things like litigation and consent decrees. So regulatory compliance, in addition to doing everything right to keep your, uh, to make sure that you're not polluting our, our waters, our valued waters, you're also dotting all the I's, crossing all T's when it comes to regulatory compliance. So far, so good. We've been able to use this and turn it around, not just from a environmental point of view, but we've been recognized for it. We've had some, uh, um, some of our contractors have made uh, presentations on it. We were featured in a Stormwater Solutions Magazine. We've been recognized by the Northwest Seaport Alliance, the Port of Seattle, and, and, and by the Envirostar program. But all of this is stuff that makes it sustainable. You start doing this stuff well, you, you get underneath it, you're under a specter of not understanding rain and not understanding compliance and then having to be, feel like you're under the gun like that guy with the shield and all the arrows. And you gotta be able to turn that around and it's tough. But if you go just a little bit more, maybe you can start actually reaping some benefits so it isn't just a cost thing. I don't know if we've recouped, well, I do know, we, we have recouped all of our costs and then some, but it's it was hard to do and it took some thinking out of the box. Um, other than that, let me, my contact details are on the end of this presentation, but I'll flip it to the beginning if there's any questions about the facility itself. I think I'm, I still have a minute to go. All right. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks so much. That was an amazing presentation. I um, that the success story is really great, and I it, it, twenty two consecutive quarters is just it's it's amazing. So, um, and I also like the fact that you guys are thinking outside the box. You spent money 
money on a, a vessel, but looking at sustainability and looking forward to your business, that was an amazing thing that you guys did above and beyond. Um, so there are a couple of questions, uh, a couple of questions about the zinc um, coating. So uh, what is the life expectancy of that coating? And the second part is what is the application timeline process and how disruptive to your normal business practices was it? Oh, that was, that was a big one because you had to keep, some things were easy, you know, of the 24 to do's, the zinc coating of getting, getting the back to that one for the warehouse roof. You can see here in this picture, the warehouse roof, the roofs itself are a BMP. They, they, all the oils and stuff in the package, the drums and the pails and the totes that we keep inside of there, inside the containment is, is the BMP. But you can see the, the guttering here on the outside, all of that goes to is now treated. So we did that to really lower it before it gets treated. Um, I keep trying to remember this one. I thought it was like a 10 year coating on the roof, but since this picture has been taken, we did all of our tanks too. And they're all perfectly painted. And that's a 20 year paint job. It was expensive. I want to say it was, um, about $150,000 for, for coating that we spent on the tanks and uh, all the railings and everything else. But, but that's 20 years. So it's going to take me to retirement. I hope so. I won't have to do the tanks again. Uh, but I think <laughs> about 20 years. I don't know if I answered all the questions, but I, that was the one on coating anyway. Yeah. Um... So was it disruptive? Did you answer that part of it? Oh, no, thank you. Um, yeah. Was, oh, goodness, because you had to have, we have three fuel stations on our dock, and we had a big piece of equipment there that took up two of them. In fact, it looked like, coincidentally, right over here, you can kind of see this big, big crane thing that's on a barge. That was over there on our fuel dock. Not that one, but one that looks just like that one. So, so it was really hard to to do some of those things because you got to stay in business now you got not just not just a bill that your your parent company has to put but you're under pressure to to recoup some of these losses so you got to keep yourself operating as best you can uh so it, you had to do a lot of planning scheduling so even above everything else you had to schedule how you were going to do things uh, digging holes to put in vaults for the stormwater system, um, which happens to be, I don't think I pointed it out, which is this container right here. And there's now some black storage uh, water settling tanks to it. But there were some challenges, yeah. Uh, parking trucks elsewhere while we did some regrading. The 24 to do's was a lot. Um, and I mm. think it took probably two years to implement everything. Uh, all 24. Thank just you. To, I, no, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ann. Sorry. I, I just wanted to um, acknowledge Mike. He, like he said, he attended our workshops. I think several of their people attended our workshops and then they reached out to us and stuff. But Mike really took this on himself. And one of the things I found really fascinating was how you, you share that doc with Shell. Yeah. So there's potential that some of what they do affects your numbers. Yeah. And he has literally split the dock in half to deal with the stormwater and Shell does not have to do that. So uh -huh. it's a very, it's an interesting situation. And I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit, Mike, but I found it fascinating how you did that. That was, that was, that was kind of interesting because, because we were in a position like where we had to capture some of their water. Uh, we, we were in a position where we absolutely couldn't do it without capturing some of their water. Um, so this area, you can see that the white shaded area or the white unshaded area, I should say, that's, that's the area of shells that is, that is currently not captured. And the dock isn't even, it, it runs like a, you had to figure out, I have other diagrams not here, where the continental divide of this dock is. So you had where on each side because it isn't just in the middle it is it does have a bow to it but you had to try to figure out without cost spending you an arm and a leg on engineering 
where all where the water goes. If you stuck the uh, stuck water here in the middle, where would it where would it go? Which side would it go to? Um, and at the end, we ended up having to capture about half of Shell's water um, in trying to get their permission to believe it or not. You think that they would be happy that you're capturing their water for you? Every organization also has, has got stormwater challenges. Everybody here on the island, uh, as Kelly can attest to, gosh, all of us has got uh, the, the target of stormwater um, upon us. So stormwater compliance and stormwater litigation. So you think that they would be welcoming of this, but it, it was really hard to get the permission levels just to capture their part at our own cost. And ultimately we never got the permission to do all of their water. And it's there, there's a cost when you take it to the sanitary sewer system. So it's not just a, a uh, an ongoing or a, an initial construction cost of capturing that water, which is substantial. Don't get me wrong, but there's an ongoing a throughput fee that you charge to the permitting thing, and then an extra volume. So, to an already taxed sewer system, combined sewer system, that's the city and the region struggles with. So it's it was another complication. Very, very a lot of moving pieces, especially with all the different phases, which I'm sure many of you are probably dealing with your own type of complications. One of the things that I'm not sure if you guys addressed um, fully, but I think all three of you received notices of intent to sue. And I'm wondering if you could maybe speak to that, how you responded, um, if you responded well, or if you responded poorly, and what would you do differently now, um, if anything? If, 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 I mean, since I'm already doing this, I will guess I'll go first on this, and I'm sure everybody, the other two will have um, their own stories to share. Uh, I wasn't here at the time for the initial response. I understand it wasn't very good. We kind of made some, by the time we figured out that it, we were in big trouble, we made some promises, timelines, it wasn't well. Uh, I think on the lawyer stuff, you'll still see NEDC conferences and other stormwater conferences where they, they talk about our lawsuit because I think it was kind of a poster child on how not to handle it. And it gets back to not understanding stormwater, but you're not understanding the, how much trouble you're in in the fixes. You have, you'll have contractors that be knocking on your door because the, they're, they're there to offer you their solution, whether it's through, oh, introduce a swale system or in, do this sort of treatment or let's do some catch basin inserts. You're going to have a lot of folks knocking on the door for all sorts of stuff. But if, you, if you're just concentrating on that, you don't also concentrate on your legal team, um, you're gonna get in trouble, you're gonna regret it. So it isn't just your environmental team that you really have to build, not just with your own people, you have to build that with your, your organization. So it's not just you guys as your environmental people, you have to build it with the, the people who control the money and they have to get on board. You have to build a good plan with your contractors. You have to choose the right contractor. Because you don't know, you just want to buy a car that's going to drive off the lot, and you don't want them to sell you something that's not going to drive off the lot. Until you figure it out, you could easily waste some money by getting the wrong stuff. But you can't ignore your legal team. If you ignore your legal team and they're not really versed in clean water lawsuits, you're going to regret it. And we did for a long time. That really magnified the amount of trouble we got in. Yeah, I, I can add a little bit to that as well. When you first receive a, an NOI, a notice of intent to sue, and you got 60 days, it's a they call it the 60 day notice. Um, and those who are issuing those are going to send you a letter that says, uh, you know, call us as soon as you can to negotiate a settlement. Um, my experience with this is they weren't generally prepared to go to court. They really just wanted to see how soon they could, uh, you know, they gather a little bit of legal fees and then uh, and then get you to give them some money. Um, so when you get that notice of intent, it will make um, all kinds of glorious claims of what you're doing wrong. Um, very most of it unfounded. It will list every condition that's in the ISGP and say you're not following it. 
it will say your SWIP is not adequate, even though they've never seen your SWIP. So, uh, you know, the first thing you want to do is just make sure that your senior management knows, hey, we've got this notice of intent. We need the right kind of legal team. Mike was very astute when he said you need a lawyer that's dealt with, understands what the Clean Water Act says, um, because a lot of these folks that are filing these litigation don't really pay attention to what the Clean Water Act really says. Um, and make sure that you have someone that understands the permit, and then you got to take a real close look at where you stand. Um, if you're being sued for failure to uh, take a corrective action, you get to level three and you miss a deadline, you miss the deadline. I mean, you really don't have a, a defense there. So be very, as I think, uh, I think Eric mentioned in his presentation, be very conscious of those uh, deadlines. Be aware of what's in there. I think a lot of people got in trouble early on um, because they really didn't understand what those deadlines really meant. Um, and they didn't really believe that uh, it was ever really going to happen to them. Um, so if, if you do find yourself in that scenario, um, yeah, get your game plan together very, very quickly and gather your, uh, gather your team. Okay, my experience has been that um, those notices of intent and um, the whole citizen lawsuit process, you know, it kind of, uh, it really focuses the attention on your organization, you know, I mean, the management uh, can, the temptation is to pay lip service to uh, uh, stormwater requirements uh, uh, sometimes, uh, and, but uh, once that uh, that NOI or citizen lawsuit uh, hits your hits your desk, all of a sudden everybody uh, perks up and then uh, you know they say jump and you ask how why you know so um, you know we didn't even have a legal team uh, until uh, until uh, we got an NOI you know and then I'm you know down meeting with. Perkins Coey downtown. You know, so that was, uh, that was uh, well out of my ballpark, and uh, I don't want to be back there again. But yeah, we actually had to do uh, two versions uh, uh, of that because the first version didn't uh, didn't uh, completely get us in require uh, compliance. So um, you know, it uh, it pays to uh, uh, pay attention as best you can and uh, not make it so that you have to have that uh, big wake up call. But unfortunately, it seems to be that. Uh, uh, they're a crucial part of uh, getting businesses to comply. So that's just the way it is, or at least some businesses. <laughs> I wouldn't put it, everybody on that uh, on that list, but uh, it, it woke us up anyway. So. The other piece is that at the conclusion of a consent degree, uh, that is going to turn out to be an agreed order between yourselves, the uh, litigating parties, and uh, ecology. And that becomes your new permit conditions for a period of time. Um, and so be very, very careful. And, you know, Mike talked a little bit about some of the stuff they just put up their hands. Yeah, we'll do that. Well, maybe not. Um, it, it is a negotiation and uh, you need to make sure that you understand what you're, what you're signing up for. Um, we spent four years working through ours uh, to culminate with a, you know, a six year timeline to install treatment um, across a very big, complicated facility, but nonetheless, six years was a long time. And that was a, a fairly significant concession for them to make. Um, and I think ecology realized that practically it just couldn't be done any other way. Uh, so they, they were willing to work with us. A bunch of milestones along the way had to be done with X thing by X time, all of those conditions that you get with an agreed order. But, uh, but it does become your new permit for, you know, at least four or five years. Of, and, during that time, I would encourage you to uh, negotiate a con uh, consent not to sue you again during that time frame. So you get all your treatment in and give yourself a year or two to prove it. Um, the permit is based on adaptive management. It is anticipated that treatment may not work the first time. Um, the other thing I'm gonna soapbox on just for a minute here and then I'll shut up. We've been, <laughs> we've been the test bed. Um, when this started, there were not stormwater treatment systems that were plug and play. Uh, and we're still learning how they work and what they will do in an industrial facility treating stormwater. Uh, as Mike said, people didn't know what stormwater was. Uh, it came out of the wastewater world. So you had treatment systems that were treating, you know, uh, plating uh, discharge and, uh, you know, byproduct of industrial processes, not stormwater running across asphalt uh, and, and going into the, into the bay. So um, it's been a challenge. Um, Ecos has done a great job helping us out. The Stormwater Center has always been there for us. So, but it, it, at the end of the day, it gets down to the folks who are doing this day to day and putting the stuff in the ground. And congratulations to both Mike and Eric for their successful projects, and we're just about done with ours. Excellent. 
We did treat one terminal for less than $250,000, by the way. It's a little bit smaller one, low tech. And one more thing, if I could. Yeah, of course. Please do, please do the basics, people. Uh, both of my co uh, presenters here mentioned a little bit about that without necessarily saying it. But what happens when you do the basics and you bring those numbers down, you're closing the delta between what your discharge is and what the benchmarks are. The closer that delta gets to be, the less invasive and less expensive your treatment solution gets to be. Okay, I treated Terminal 30 for $240,000 because we were exceeding benchmark by fives and tens. Okay, it wasn't 600 for zinc; it was 130 for zinc. So we were able to go with the uh, you know uh, cage space and inserts with the treatment uh, media bags in them, and it cost me $60,000 a year to chase out those bags in 100 catch basins. Um, the facility had some existing uh, water quality vaults, um, but those weren't doing the trick. And, and so it just took this extra nudge um, to get there. But without a uh, really consistent, heavy duty, good quality sweeping, um, those catch basins are going to get plugged up and you don't have a treatment system anymore. Uh, and so I'm going to take my sweeper hat off now, but go, go buy a <laughs> sweeper for crying out loud. <laughs> I second what you said because you're, you're spot on, Kelly. We, our initial decree was our treatment system was going to be probably 10 times more expensive than it was. And it wasn't needed. It wasn't going to do anything better. We've had 22 quarters without a benchmark exceed. It's, it's what we have is working fine, but doing the basics, trying to figure out what you really, really need is, is really your, is your first step before you decide on a treatment and pushing that legal team, having your legal team push back on that, and not do what we did and say, we'll do that, we'll do that, we'll do whatever you want, it is, is key. Great. This is great information, you guys. I'm going to just really quickly share my screen and finish off um, the presentation. Um, as you know, Travis Porter is the permit writer, so he can be contacted for information. Um, we do have several classes available. Um, Lisa and I worked on the 303D list presentation with Ecology. It's free. It's available online. Con contact us if you're interested. Uh, the basic building blocks of stormwater permit kind of management kind of goes over the basics of it. That's free. It's available both through ECOS and the Washington Stormwater Center. You can check with me for links and supplemental information that will support those um, presentations. And then we've got a series of four webinars that you can check out on our website and purchase for view. Um, and if you guys have any other questions, this is our contact information. I will follow up with a uh, contact information from both Lisa and I, as well as the three presenters. Um, I encourage you to utilize this all as resources. And I'm just going to turn it over to Lisa real quick if you have any additional thoughts or anything to add. Yeah, I do actually, you know, one of the things I didn't mention about the Stormwater Center is that we are a neutral third party. We were set up by the legislature to be that, um, that source of information for permittees where we, we don't share information with ecology. Um, and I, so I just wanted to let you guys know we are a neutral third party. Um, we're not regulatory. Um, we just do technical assistance. So I want to reassure you that if you contact us, we're not going to contact the regulators. Um, but thank you all for, for coming. And I want to really thank our panelists as well. That was great information. Um, you know, I feel like we could have talked for another couple of hours. Unfortunately, we don't have that much time, but, um, but thank you again. Um, we do have two quick questions. So I don't know if you guys can answer oh. these. Um, one is, can yes, you disclose sorry. who served the notice of intent or is that confidential information? What do you mean by served? Who, who delivered it, or who was the uh, the, the suing suing party? I think probably the party. Yeah, the moving party. Um, you just don't keep reliance for us across the board. Yes. That's okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And then uh, this is just, I think, a comment. We had zinc levels 850 plus, all galvanized roofing. We coated the roofing and downspouts, and most recent lab results were 5.2. Woohoo! Nice. Love hearing the things others Excellent. have done. 
Yeah, that's awesome. excellent. Great. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, we're so grateful for your presence. Uh, we will follow up with an email with some contact information and also the link so you can watch this again if you would like to go back and look at things. Thank you so much. Uh, we greatly appreciate your attendance. Take care.